join us for the discussion. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your nice presentations, for sticking uh, to time. Um, and we do have some, some interesting questions um, from, from the audience that, that we can cover. Um, so one of the questions that I wanted to start with is a lot of people, particularly in, in the phage world, and a lot, and this happens a lot for uh, new students and people who look, first look at genomes and stuff, they're always um, scared of all of these hypoth hypothetical proteins, right? And they, they think something's wrong with it. Can you kind of put them at ease or tell us how you deal with it? Is it an, is it an issue with your tools? Is it not? Um, how, do hypo uh, how do hypothetical proteins in genomes get handled? I'd like to start with um, Juan. Uh, hi, um, I don't know exactly, but uh, because we are uh, focusing on use uh, one of the tools used to to provide the the proteins from from the sequence, which is Prodigal, and yes, I consider that it works mm, good for that for that point. So, so the question is. Um, doesn't matter whether uh, a protein that is predicted has a functional annotation or not. No, it's not necessary because we are only using the the sequence of amino acids to compare them with the BPF models in, in our case. And it's not necessary uh, that every protein has a, a signal function. Yeah. In our case, it's, it's not necessary. Um, Christina? Um, yes, so my answer is pretty similar. Um, knowing the function of the protein is always nice and it gives more confidence, right? Knowing it's a major capsid protein or a replication protein um, gives us confidence in our pre future predictions, but it's not really necessary to know the function of the protein for the VIR class to put them together into protein clusters and to uh, further the genome clusters. And my guess is that for none of the tools, uh, um, yeah, it is an issue. Yeah, so I can't really add too much to that. Um, yeah, it yeah. So I was, I was thinking, can, can we kind of bring it further? Can we then use um, potentially use the classification tools to um, improve the annotations of the genomes? Mm, in the case of um, sorry, I started out of. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, good. So in the case of VIRCLAST, actually, that's something that um, I have implemented at the protein annotation step, right? So the very last of, of VIRCLAST actually handles protein annotations. And the way um, VIRCLAST do does that is taking every protein and compares it with a bunch of uh, different uh, databases. And then when, when it's returning the results to the user, is returning them together with the information, these proteins belong to this cluster. So the user can look at all the proteins in one cluster, uh, the annotations returned by the different uh, databases and decide uh, on one consensus of annotation, if that's the case, or sometimes discover, oh, this protein actually has two domains, right? So the cross can, can return um, protein domains and the user can say, um, maybe uh, this protein has two domains, or maybe I have used two relaxed parameters for the protein clustering, go back and start again. So um, yes, uh, VIRCLAST is using quite heavily the protein clustering to help the user with the protein annotations. Because if one protein is hypothetical by comparison with the databases, but is clustering together with something that we can annotate, then uh, very we have to be very careful, but we can translate the same, um, yeah, transfer the same annotation to this hypothetical protein as well. Ben, can you can you add the, the network perspective on this? Um, well, I know we've had a few groups use um, vContact to kind of identify core genes um, in a particular virus cluster. Um, so I could definitely see a situation where you had a group of unknown viruses with maybe one or two hallmarks um, and a portion of their genome that are um, shared consistently um, within that group. 
Um, and so they use, those could represent core genes. Um, and I would you know, recommend someone that they could follow up with experimental or structural studies on those genes to figure out what they are. So even if they're classified as um, hypotheticals, um, you could still do something with them you know, that could help improve your annotation. And then it's kind of guilt by association. If you have another virus that is related to that particular virus group, and you see that they're connected via these, you know, these two or three genes, you might be able to infer what those functions could be. Um, but as always, I always defer to the person running the contact as they should, they are likely the expert in their area. And so that might be something they're more familiar with than I would be. Okay. Um, Juan? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? So basically, when you do the protein, when you do protein clustering, can you use the classification of, of what, you've, what you've done to kind of improve your um, genome annotation or protein annotations to get rid of some of the hypothetical proteins? Would that be something that would be possible um, with PPF class? Yes, of course, because yeah, one of the improvements that we are thinking in our tool is to consider uh, for the present format, we are using uh, a classification for the taxonomy and the host prediction. And we are thinking to to improve the tool uh, using um, the annotation of different functions obtained from different databases like uh, Uniprot, for instance, uh, to improve this annotation, not only for taxonomy, mainly for the host prediction. Yeah, so it, it sounds like from, from all of the angles, we can maybe have a sort of iterative process going on um, there as well. Um, and then I need to um, remind students, um, as Matt did yesterday, to not keep reiterating everything um, so that you can actually finish your PhD. Um, so thanks, thanks for this, uh, answering this first question. Um, I'm going to move on to a different one, which is um, kind of uh, technical. Um, so what's the consensus way to transform pairwise comparisons to clusters? Um, at, at any of the available taxonomic ranks. Is there a volunteer to start? <laughs> I think that it's a very good question because uh, like uh, our tool is, it's not based in this, in this clustering, but uh, I'm thinking we are uh, working uh, in the comparison between my tool and the and the other two by it on on this it's different to compare and yeah probably you can use a hierarchical clustering or cluster one or something like that for that point christina um, right so if the question is what is the consensus way of uh, transforming the distances to uh, clusters, I would say, as we have seen from the talks today, there is actually no consensus. <laughs> so there is no just one way of doing that. There's, there are more ways. Um, my way of the Viridic or Vil class ways are to cluster the distances hierarchically, right? So use some type of agglomerative methods and put them into some hierarchies which um, if you ask me, it's making sense when thinking about the way ICTV is actually trying to classify viruses right into uh, units which become bigger and bigger and bigger to encompass more and more viruses. So actually that was one of the motivations to, to start VIRCLAST because I wanted something that was able to put things into bigger and bigger boxes. But um, so VIRCLAST is still, let's say, in development. It's not, um, it's pre-released. It's not yet officially released, let's call it like that. Um, I'm still uh, doing benchmarking and looking at the data. I would think for the moment that uh, maybe we could use it family or maybe order level, but my feeling, so just an initial feeling is that um, above these levels, it would be hard to, to put um, things together because the, 
they will just have less and less common uh, protein clusters, and that will make life quite uh, quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ben. Can you comment because you did some between vContact one and vContact two? You did some optimization of this. Yeah. Yep. So, um, actually, I wanted to echo what uh, Christina was saying. Um, I don't know if there's a consensus. Um, we decided to use hierarchical clustering um, as a component of that refinement step that I was mentioning, um, and we chose that because of you know other people in the uh, in the research area had also used hierarchical clustering. And then when we applied it to the ICTV genomes, we found that um, that method worked the best out of all of the, we tried a handful of them, um, different clustering methods. And so when vContact is doing its refinement step, it actually is doing hierarchical clustering of each one of those VCs and comparing them um, and using that distance to kind of threshold and figure out um, what should be a genus and what shouldn't be. Um, and yeah, like Christine was saying, I can't really like reiterate it that much more, but well, there's, um, there's at the a, higher there's toxin technical... ranks, it becomes more and more challenging because you don't have those shared genes. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that that's a problem for vContact. Um, I'm sure it's gonna be a problem for any tool that relies on similarity, so. There's a quick technical follow-up. When you do hierarchical clustering, do you do complete or single? Oh, um, right. I prefer complete. And I think I also implemented, or I give the option to do average. Okay. Uh, for Virclast, uh, actually for Viridic, I uh, also prefer complete. Well, I have to look back in my code. Uh, I think the default is complete, but for uh, Viridic, I just gave a bunch of options uh, for the user to, to play a bit and see how the heat maps look and so on. Okay. Anybody um, else? Have yeah, I, I it's complete. <laughs> like, I, I don't know <laughs> if there's like, yeah. Juan, um, did you have anything to add or? No, I think that Christina is um, completely true in, in, his, in his opinion. And I remember other works, uh, other studies about uh, other areas that there are a lot of uh, ways to for, for, for this kind of, of comparison between different clusters. And um, it's probably that we, we must develop um, a new uh, a new way to to compare these viral clusters. For all of you, all three of you, um, how easy or difficult would it be to do some some sort of bootstrapping um, kind of statistical um, significance of each of the clusters that are created? Um, of, of any of the classifications, or maybe it is already implemented. Um, can you comment on this? If, if, well, if um, I can start, uh, yeah. I just mentioned that uh, our one of our goals when we begin with with this tool is to provide, uh, like we mentioned, like the confidence score of this classification, uh, which is a way that we can compare um, if this uh, classification uh, assigned to, to some sequence is, is good or it is not good and always compare it with uh, a set of uh, previously classified uh, uncultivated viral genomes. Uh, at that point, uh, the user um, could consider if, for instance, in our case, if a confidence score of uh, 0 0.5 is good or it is not good, it depends on, on its, uh, if you want uh, probably less classification, but better classifications, we can move this, this rank. Okay, and Ben? Oh my gosh, uh, can you repeat the question? That was, um, 
sorry, a question just popped up and I lost. What was the question again? I apologize. Um, um, of any, any type of, you know, your confidence scores, oh, your statistical, yeah, or right. your statistical support for any of the clusters. Yeah, so the, the um, confidence score kind of incorporates some elements of that as well. Um, uh, it, the network theory is a little complex, but within each VC that is, um, they go through a number of different generations in order to get that confidence value. Um, and I can tell you that at least for vContact 2, when we were um, trying to benchmark the tool in and of itself, um, I think we ran the tool like a hundred times or a thousand times on the same data set. And um, we got absolutely identical results every time. And that is because of how the underlying tools reach their uh, local, their maxima or their mi minima. Um, <laughs> and yeah, because of that, the ch they don't really change all that much. Um, there is a little bit of wicker room in terms of the protein clusters, um, but once you've established a matrix with you know twenty thousand by a hundred thousand um, elements, um, the 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 network doesn't really change all that much. So like the underlying little things might change a little bit, but the overall final score really doesn't. Well, at least that's what we've seen with reference data. I have no idea with a million genomes what would change, but well, hopefully um, not much. that's next paper then, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Christina, can you comment on this for Viridic and Birdclast? Right, so um, let's start with Birdclast. Birdclast has a bootstrapping option at the level of uh, clustering genomes and um, it's working. I don't use it that often because it's killing my servers, basically. <laughs> it depends on the, on the data set. But whenever you start bootstrapping, uh, what bootstrapping is doing basically is taking the big table of uh, genome versus uh, protein clusters, right? And it's trying, it's starting to remove from uh, the protein clusters. So, and then calculates again uh, distances and again and again and again and again. Um, right, so that's kind of intensive uh, work, and at some point, because of uh, this removal of the protein clusters, I'm even asking myself if it's actually meaningful, because if you eliminate all the proteins which are in common with another genome, and then you calculate the distance, of course, the distance will be zero, right, because you just eliminated the, uh, the common rows. Uh, but yeah, the option is there, and it can be used. Um, Right. For uh, Viridic, um, <laughs> the way, yeah, I was thinking about implementing such a bootstrapping, but to be honest, I haven't yet figured out how to do that at the uh, alignment, at the nucleic acid alignment level. So, no, for the Viridic, there is no bootstrap. Okay. Um, one, one more thing to add, actually, back to VIR class. Um, I'm also using another uh, indicator of uh, the clustering. So that would be the silhouette uh, width. And that's uh, something that's also visually indicated um, in colors in the heat map or in the visual representation. Basically, if it's green, all the genomes uh, belong to the respective clusters. If it's white, it's kind of K, they could belong to this cluster or to the other cluster. And if it's red, that's uh, no, definitely don't belong to that cluster. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna um, sw switch things up a bit. And this is um, not technical at all, and it's more conceptual um, or, you know, maybe even philosophical. Um, so this is question is um, for all speakers today. What are your recommendations to how new scientists to the field should process viral community data in terms of naming conventions? Um, it seems like it's not recommended to take an approach like 16S does to name bacteria given the lack of marker genes across virus types. Are we just going to use POTU number 44 uh, and providing re representative sequences in a database somewhere? Um, so I think that this is probably a slightly loaded question for everybody and maybe not expected. So uh, who, who, right. who likes so, to get started? I'm not commenting on it. Um, I'm actually 
well, when I have developed the tools, I came from the perspective of the person who isolates viruses. So, you know, you can isolate 100 viruses, maybe 1,000. Uh, well, if you have a lot of PhD students, maybe 10,000. Uh, but still, it's a finite number, so you can start giving them names. And um, I prefer to give them unique strain names. Um, and then I actually like very much the bacterial convention, genus name, species epithet. So that would be quite great for me. Um, I have to admit, I haven't given it too much thought about what to do with all these um, environmental viral genomes. <laughs> Uh, definitely mm, that doesn't work. So I don't know, I don't have, maybe numbering would work, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Ben, uh, what are your um, thoughts? So yeah, this has actually been a pointed question to our group, to the Sullivan Lab, and as well as the number of papers that have all used vContact to help classify. And they get, you know, hundreds or thousands of new viral genera as defined by the contact. Um, and so really the issue is, is less, um, do we have faith or confidence in those genera? It's whether we should name those a particular, using some particular scheme. Um, and I don't think, we certainly haven't come up with a solution to that, like an actual nomenclature solution. Um, but we are trying to move towards, at least for vContact, um, a way of incorporating environmental data sets so that when a user runs their data, um, they will have a greater chance of hitting environmental data sets or something so that they can be able to say, hey, this is, I have a hundred new genera in my, in my data set, but there's already an existing, you know, environmental reference piece of data out there that um, I know um, that I don't have a hundred new genera. I've got ninety-nine, or some, you know, something along that to that effect. Um, yeah, and I think moving forward, we'll just have to, like, how how do you know if you have a new genus or not without comparing it to everything that's existed before? Um, and when you start talking about a million genomes. Um, you know, it's, it's really how to find that kind of scale or the references in order to match against those. So we'll have to, you know, maybe some giant mega database with all of the VCs from all of the data sets is in a centralized repository. And so whenever someone searches their particular sequences, it also searches that main database and says, hey, uh, you know, this paper published five years ago had this VC that you're matching to. So you don't have, you don't really have a novel yeah. uh, viral genera. You have another environmental genera that just is not defined. I think that's a good point you raise because I think um, with all of these separate viromic studies and everybody using, you know, the same RefSeq database, but then not anybody else's, then you end up repeating, I found this novel thing, you know, maybe three times across different studies and it's all the same thing. Um, and if I can extend that answer, I think it's compounded by the fact that not every lab has the computational resources to compare their particular data set against everything else that exists. Um, and not to call anyone out, but if you're at IMG or JGI and you have those resources to compare, you know, 5 million VOTUs against each other um, in order to define 10,000 or 100,000 new genera. You know, there's no way that a small lab, you know, in Ohio is going to be able to compare their new metagenome against, you know, those 10,000 or, you know, 10,000 new genera or whatever it is. Um, and so for their study, they won't be able to say they have anything new or they could, but really that genus already kind of exists, that metagenomic genus bin already exists somewhere. They just don't have the means in order to identify it. If I might just uh, jump in, I actually feel that part of the problem is that uh, the viral genomes 
uh, so distributed amongst different databases, right? So uh, I have to go to NCBI, I have to go to IMGVR, and then I have to check the Gov data set from um, the iVirus uh, servers and so on. And uh, I have to admit at some point, I gather all these resources on my servers. So um, our isolates, whenever we have them, we always compare them to the environmental data sets. But uh, it's a lot of work and maybe one or two years ago, I stopped doing it because it's a lot of maintenance, right? So uh, for the next batch of environmental isolates that we want to publish, I have to check again all the publications, check again where I can download them, recompile the data and so on. So maybe that's a discussion for tomorrow actually for the database section but definitely one database for all viruses <laughs> isolate and environment oh my god that would be so great i would yeah. love that i totally forgot we had a database <laughs> yes. um um juan what, what are your thoughts on, on this no, naming no. I, I completely agree with ben and, and with christina because when you try to perform a, um, a first experiment or to obtain the, the truth about the, 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 the known uh, viruses annotated in databases, it's, it's, a, it's a hard task to, to initiate this, this work and will be very nice to, to have a, a consortium of, of, of these of this annotation in all of people in the same database. It's, it yeah. will be very nice. Yeah, I think I think maybe here's the time for me um, to, to quickly give like uh, um, an official ICDV kind of point of view on, on all of this. Um, because for, for many people who are familiar with the um, either the botanical or the zoological or the bacterial codes, um, there it is, if you publish something with a, with a certain name, um, then you know you have priority and that's going to be the name. So that's not how virus taxonomy works, right? So we are in, in actually a good position, I would say, to, to have these type of placeholders names in, in papers where you say, okay, this is now you know, VC 44, and this is now meaningful um, in, the, in, the, in the setting of my study. And then let's work together with the ICTV to now formalize this as a, a, an official taxon. And at the moment that you make it into an official taxon, um, it, gets, it gets a name. Um, now, that poses a different uh, difficulty now, of course, because then you still want to be able to, once that name is official, be able to trace it back to your paper. Um, and that's where we sometimes get into this circular um, situation and Christina can can attest to that because you know um she found all of these you know new new virus new phage families in in her environmental um data set uh, and then she wants to formalize them but then then this this has come across in some of the questions what do you do then first do you try to get the taxonomy um correct so that you accurately describe in your paper what the what the taxonomy is or do you publish first and then um you know, have it officialized with the chance that the name that you've used has already been taken or you used a, a slightly different threshold. So you need to reassess everything. Um, and, and I think that there might not be a perfect, perfect solution to this. Um, and, as a, and as a side note, so we're trying to um, make some of some guidelines together with people from NCBI um, for, for um, deposition of your um, your virome genomes or your UVIGs. Um, and so one of the things is that we're currently writing um, something that is uh, on the desk of um, the NCBI people about you know, how best to go ahead with depositing your um, and naming your UVIG genomes into GenBank because they need to be in GenBank if they need to be, um, if they're going to be officialized into taxonomy. So obviously we don't want GenBank to be flooded with the whole IMGVR database. So we're, we're, we, um, what, what we then want to do is only make an official taxon if a genome 
uh, and this comes from the bioinformatics expert group and the metagenomic study group of ICTV, if there's two independent observations of the same metagenomic sequence, um, and only then make this into a, 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 you know, a new species or a new representative. Um, so um, it, it, all, it all gets quite uh, complicated at times. <laughs> um, and I think naming uh, is, is very much, uh, nomenclature is very much part of taxonomy, but in the meantime, you need to have something that works. And uh, if, if that's VC something that, that works for me, if that is, um, I don't know, uh, Christina, how you name um, clusters in, in, in Verklust. Um, you know, the, these things, um, they, have, they have meaning within the, the study that you're publishing or are, are doing. Right. <laughs> sorry, that's a slight rambling from my end. Yeah, sorry, I just have to um, admit you you have raised pain, painful memories uh, of one taxonomic proposal where we had a family of environmental uh, of marine viruses with one environmental representative from the Gov data set and we made it to the second round of the <laughs> taxonomic proposals when the environmental genome was kicked out because it was not present in NCBI. <laughs> so that was painful. Yeah. And I guess the complete Gov data set will not see uh, ICTV recognition as long as it's not present in NCBI. No, it, oh. exactly. That's yeah, yeah. So, so that's one of the things because we can we um, one of the the reasons is that the genome needs to be annotated as an annotated sequence record in a in a in the virus in a virus database. So, um, yeah. Um, but yeah. these these things, um, there's there's a whole bunch of people constantly thinking about what's the best way, and there's all these arguments for and against as well. And maybe this can come uh, come up again, again tomorrow. Um, maybe I'll I'll type some questions then. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, do you have any more thoughts on on names, or shall I move on to another question? Um, so somebody asks um, how you would suggest combining multiple tools if they are in conflict. Oh, look into the data. Look into what's giving the conflict or what uh, the genomes have in common. Look at the proteins that, or uh, the genes that they share. So this is um, why I don't favor this type of trees where only I see the trees and uh, I see the leaves of the tree and maybe some bootstrap values, but I don't know why, uh, I don't know what features actually put together these viruses. Are they uh, captured proteins? Are they replication proteins? What brought those viruses together? So this is why I like more, uh, well, beer class, but also v contact because I can go back in the data and I can dig in and I can see these proteins uh, are responsible. So uh, yeah, definitely look into the data and uh, try to figure out starting from there. Any additions to this? Um, yeah, looking at the data is always what kind of the, one of the mantras of vContact um, and that we try to be pretty conservative. With Am I still we... with you? Oh, sorry, um, right. that could have been my internet connection. Were, then... were we all gone um, or was it just me? No, no, I was here. I think I was here. I hope I was here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sorry, so I missed the last 30, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, okay. Um, what was I? Uh, yeah, vContact tries to be pretty conservative. Um, and so you'll find that sometimes your metagenome will have lots of outlier overlap or unclustered sequences. Um, and that's basically telling the user, hey, please go through this, look at your data. You're the one that knows it best. Um, so try to 
view context two can only give you so much so much information um, as a tool in order to you know follow up on that. Yeah, definitely looking into your data, and um, I I haven't done like a comprehensive analysis myself, um, but I know that from uh, Christina's work and Joanne's work that um, the tools generally agree for the most part for most of their classifications. Um, once you start getting to nitty gritty or certain parts of the virosphere, sure, there's going to be disagreements, but by and large, they they agree well with each other. Um, and so I would think that the problem should be relatively small, depending on your particular data set, especially if you started to talk about more reference-based, like things that are already published in, in NCBI, they should agree really well. Um, it's the more novel areas of the network with the underrepresented sequence space um, that I think you'll find some um, differences. And then like Christine was saying, look, look at the data. Um, yeah. Go on. yeah, I'm agree with, with Ben and with Christina that in my opinion, that it's necessary to use uh, different tools uh, depending on the on the goal of, of the study and the, and the data set. For instance, uh, I put on, on the paper that uh, for VPF class, uh, if you want to classify uh, every sequence uh, individually, you can use our tool, but you only have a classification if we have a VPF classified in uh, on a specific genera, on a specific uh, family. And uh, for example, using uh, other tools than from the Ben uh, tool, you can provide uh, another classification for, for the unclassified uh, sequences uh, about our tool, for instance. And then my my recommendation uh, will be to, to use different tools. Are there are there any kind of features that are that weigh heavier in your decision making when when there's a conflict? If there's like if there's a certain protein that you see um, that should be weighed more heavily than 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 others, can you comment on that? So like a, a specific sequence, protein sequence is like an outlier? Yeah, or... I, I'm, I'm just thinking like if you, um, you know, if, if you look at your data and you see that part of the decision making is based on structural proteins and part of it is on, on replication um, proteins and they, they, they each go to a separate cluster. Um, is there something that you would weigh more heavily or do you just say okay this is a this is a um, recombinant genome and, and we leave it as a as a overlap at slash outlier I, I don't think there's anything inherent in at least how a lot of these tools work um, to weigh a particular set of sequences more than another. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's already mechanisms in each of the tools to kind of recognize and identify those areas and let the user figure out how they want to handle it. But if I had to make a split decision, I would say that maybe VPF class, um, because it is geared towards um, a large scale, a large set of reference um, uh, VPFs that you could use that to guide your decision making um, when you're trying to figure out how to classify a particular group, um, because it does have references that are you know tied to a specific database. Whereas I would argue VioCluster and VContact don't don't really use reference databases. So yeah, I would just leverage their mechanisms for identifying the outliers. 
Okay, Sorry, Christina, do you want to add something? I mean, I agree with Ben. Uh, we, yeah, a weird class uses distances, right, in between genomes, and there is only so much that we can encode in one single value, right? It's a number, basically, so it's not much information um, that can be encoded there, and definitely we don't know which proteins participate more or yeah, could create problems unless we actually look at the data. If I would have a favorite, if, for example, I would see two different genomes, which maybe have um, more similarities at the replication module, but the structural uh, module indicates, I don't know, typho viral morphology, and for the other one indicates poroviral morphology, how would I classify that? Well, I don't know yet. I have to think about it. <laughs> that, that would be a hard one. Uh, would replication weigh more compared to housing? Yeah. Or should housing <laughs> weigh more compared to replication? Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that yet. Sorry. <laughs> No, I, I'm I'm not really expecting an answer. I'm just um, you know uh, trying to to organize a brainstorm here because one of the things that um, you know one of the dogmas that used to be in in um, in phage genomics, which is um, luckily um, kind of disproven, is that there's rampant mosaicism, right, and module swapping. And actually, it's only a subset of phages that do that. But how do we then? Uh, and this goes for any type of um, virus that does recombination that um, maybe with multiple segments even, like what do you weigh more heavily and how do you structure your hierarchy in it? And I guess um, if you have a network, you don't really have to worry about it that much. Um, um, does anybody want to comment on that? Or ben, you have the network. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, I guess the question is, how do you solve the problem of the lambdoid uh, bacteriophages, for example? Yeah, so yeah, those are always the biggest problem. And in fact, if you look at B-Contact 2 and you narrow zoom in on the problematic areas, you find that that is actually one of the areas that V-Contact struggles to classify. Well, the, the microphages where they're like, I don't know, 90% of their genes get shuffled up. Um, yeah. And that just messes with the network-based approaches. Um, uh, yeah, and so those, those are always room for improvement. And yeah, I, I bet if we implemented some sort of reference-based um, uh, like hallmarks or something for those particular virus groups, um, we'd be able to maybe more easily identify them. But then that would be us like, um, uh, like kind of asserting our a priori like knowledge to that problem. Um, and we wanted to try to keep V contact as you know ag agnostic as possible. Um, so yeah, I. People ask me that question all the time, and I just never know how to answer it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a problem, um, yeah. and we're trying to solve it. But at least we can tell you that, hey, this is a problem in our network. So if you have a virus that matches that or that area, that group, um, you know, you're like, hey, I hit a lot of microphages. Um, so I probably need to look at the microphage literature to figure that out. Yeah. Um, come on, do do you have any thoughts? Yes, um, um, and for that point, I think that um, it's important, for instance, in, in our case, we try to infer a classification for the viral protein families. Um, it's necessary to distinguish uh, in similar, for example, viral sequences to assign um, how it's important the assignation of, of some protein to uh, to the same of different viral protein families because uh, probably there can be uh, a lot of different sequences that uh, obtain the same hits with the same protein for the same uh, viral protein families. It's important to 
um, improve in, in this case uh, our tool in that point uh, to distinguish what is the importance of of this heat for some specific proteins to the viral protein families. Uh, and uh, now, for instance, we are working in, in, in some improvement of, of our tool based on, on a similar idea on that. Yeah, I think uh, kind of inserting my own uh, opinion here um, for myself um, and from looking at the fact that ICTP has this hierarchical taxonomy with all of these ranks, but we don't have to use all of the ranks. Um, at the moment, I'm dealing with the problem by just, you know, skipping a rank. And you can see like, okay, we have clear species and, and genus groups, and we might have a clear um, order group. So for now, because everything's like this big blurry blob, um, we're, we're not going to define these because we, we cannot find the correct right criteria and I think a lot of people may have an issue with that because you you you, you want to have you know everything in a box but sometimes you know it just doesn't it just doesn't fit and and my personal solution is just skipping skipping taxonomical ranks where we cannot define clearly define something that is robust mm -hmm. but uh, so we we're we're working on the lambda viruses but. <laughs> um, I think uh, Matt is commenting some in the in the in the, in the chat. Um, some problems may just not be able to be solved. Uh, okay, we have um, about uh, seven minutes left, and and I got I, I got a um, kind of a private message with a good question to ask, um, and. That is, for each of you, can you briefly describe what the limitations of your tool are and what kind of keeps you up at night about it? And maybe what you want help and community feedback for to improve this. Um, Juan. Um, wow. Um... Probably for me, uh, one limitation could be uh, the necessity of the use of two previous tools like Prodigal and HMM Search for the final classification of uh, every sequence comparing with the, with the VPS because we depends on these other tools. Um, Another one could be that we can uh, only can classify um, sequences for which we have some classified BPF in this rank, for instance. Then it's it's a different approximation of try to make clustering. I have put in, and yes, probably this could be some some troubles or some <laughs> limitation of, of our tool. Yeah. But there are time to, to improve it. <laughs> Fair <laughs> thinking on that, yeah. Thanks, um, uh, Christina. Right, so there is always place for improvement, apparently. And uh, I also have some, um, well, to do or to-do list or wish list, let's see if the, I will ever uh, come around to implement them. For example, for Viridic, but also for Virclast, in this case, um, multi-party uh, genomes are not yet implemented, right? So they will be treated, um, yeah, the different segments will be treated as different genomes by both tools. And that's something that I should, come around to, to find a solution for that. That's one thing. The other thing is um, in the case of Viridic, I still have to think more about how to deal with genomes which have large repeat, yeah, like large repeated regions. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an issue that I know. Um, right, Virglast, um, 
well, Will class is kind of fresh for me as well. And the wish list <laughs> of features, it's quite big, <laughs> my private wish list. Um, benchmarking and testing uh, weird class with as many uh, taxonomic viral groups as possible and eventually finding uh, distance thresholds which would work uh, for the different realms of uh, orders of families uh, you know that would be great and I would love the community feedback I I was doing it for caudovirales um, but uh, it's a lot of effort. It's like reclassifying all the viruses out there and uh, it's just a lot. So I just do it more or less on a need to do basis for the viruses or for the groups that I uh, we need to classify in my group. Yeah, uh, that's something. Um, another thing, I created both tools having in mind isolate. I know that uh, Viridic has been used for virons as well. So it is in theory uh, created to use multiple cores. Um, I'm waiting for the community feedback to know how, <laughs> how well that, that works. Uh, Virclass as well can uh, use in most steps multiple uh, cores. Um, which is actually a problem for our servers when two users come on our website and use Vclast in the same time. Uh, and we have a third user, independent user using the server, then we have a big problem. And uh, quite often it ends up with uh, one of the users not getting their data, unfortunately. So we have the IT uh, wizard working on a solution and trying to send the VIRCLAST uh, analysis to the HPC soonish, <laughs> will be implemented soonish. <laughs> and uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, I'm always at the other end of the email. I might not always have the time to answer all the emails. I'm trying um, to have them all in mind and eventually get to the issues they raise and address them. Yeah, so keep, keep them coming. Thanks. Okay. Um, actually, I've thought about a lot thought about this a lot, and I would basically summarize it as um, eliminating the limit to the number of genomes that can be processed at any one time. Um, and two um, would be having a more centralized database so that users would um, uh, know the novelty of their particular data set. But Maybe that's a discussion better suited for tomorrow's database yeah. Um, section. Yeah, I think we'll always get incremental improvements um, in vContact um, by changing options and parameters here and there. And I do see it going a little bit higher. Um, but at some point, the information that you can find in each genome is going to be there's a maximum of information you can extract from that, just given the pure sequence data. Um, so. That doesn't necessarily keep me up at night, but it does, um, you know, con it's concerning. Uh, but I can't really control that. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, from from my end, uh, I just uh, wanted to let everybody know that if you want the um, submit taxonomy proposals, we have people who are part of the taxonomy committee, uh, um, and everybody is listed on the ICTV website. So if you want to, if you're interested in in doing that, look at you know the the area of bacteriophages or archaeal viruses or any other type of viruses of interest of you, and contact the relevant people. If you can't find them, contact me. Um, uh, and then uh, we can we can make a plan. Uh, with that, I, I would like to thank the panelists very much for their presentations and their insightful comments and discussions. I hope everybody of the participants um, had uh, as many of their questions answered as possible. Um, thank you very much. Uh,